All right, welcome everyone um, <coughs> to the St. Louis Lambert Airport uh, privatization meeting. Uh, I'm Stephanie Lewis with Grove, Missouri, and we have a number of people that will be available to um, speak with you and answer some of your questions. Um, one of our uh, speakers today will be Mike Wagner. Mike is an attorney with Claiborne, Sable, and Wagner, um, and he'll be actually conducting the presentation today. Also joining us is Mike Jones, and Mike Jones is one of the advisors with Jones Strategic Advisors. We also have in the room Paul Payne, who's uh, head of the working group, and Paul is uh, the city's budget director. He's sitting there, so he'll also be available to answer any of your questions. We also have Linda Martinez, and Linda is the deputy mayor of development. She's sitting there. She'll also be able to answer any of your questions. And walking in at any moment will be Lawan Strickland. Uh, Lawan is with Metropolitan Strategies and Solutions. He's also a part of the working group and the communications team, and he'll be joining us up here in just a moment. But we don't want to delay. Uh, we appreciate your time, and uh, we'll get started. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, <clears throat> again, my name is Mike Wagner. I'm a partner with the law firm of Claiborne and Wagner. Uh, we are one of the consultants uh, with the city. Uh, in studying the issue of uh, entering the uh, St. Louis International Airport into what's known as a public-private partnership or a P-free arrangement. Um, we've done these public presentations for quite some time and our presentation has grown over time as we've deepened in the process. So these presentations have uh, now gotten to the point where the city has uh, taken a draft request for qualifications and, and advertise that request for qualifications and the replies to those RFQs are due by Friday. And, uh, and so what, as, we, as we progress through our presentation tonight, you're gonna see different timelines uh, and, and how this process has moved forward. So the idea between, uh, about this presentation is to kind of give you an overview of what a P3 is, um, kind of how P3s fit in both uh, on a local, national, and international scale. Uh, the process that the working group has used in gathering information and presenting that information to the city, and then the process that we would anticipate moving forward uh, with the information that has been gathered. So with that being said, um, I would like to, to request everyone, I know I, I see some familiar faces in the audience and I see some new faces and, and everyone is welcome and we certainly will have plenty of time for dialogue. Um, I would ask if you have a specific question about a slide or something I've said, I'm more than happy to stop the presentation and answer, but out of respect for the people that have not seen the presentation yet, what I would like to do is try to work our way through the slides, uh, get the information out there so that when we do have our dialogue on some of the more meaty issues that everyone in the room has seen the same information so that we're, we're all kind of speaking from the same standpoint, the same uh, uh, standpoint when it comes to how much information has been presented. So that being said, uh, we'll go ahead and go to our first slide. Uh, <coughs> One of the things that we wanted to make sure everybody understood on the outset is how airports are funded uh, here in the United States. It's a common kind of misconception, uh, at least that's what the working group uncovered in some of the uh, outreach work that we've done in, in polling uh, citizens and residents and, and travelers as to how they thought airports were, were funded. So what we wanted to make sure is that everyone understood that it's a common kind of misconception that airports are funded with taxpayer dollars or a general tax on the citizens. And in reality, the infrastructure of U.S. airports are funded by different pots of money that do not come from general taxes. One being airport generated revenue from landing fees, tenant rents, and terminal revenues. Those are what we would call operational revenues. Those are amounts of money that the airport would use to budget their operational costs and keep things going on an ongoing basis and maybe service some of their existing infrastructure debt. There are federal grants that are available through the FAA's uh, AAI, or AIP program that can be used for infrastructure improvements and there's also PFC charges that can be authorized by the FAA for specific capital improvements. Think of that as kind of a bond issue for an airport. They would issue debt and then they would recover money through fees in order to repay that debt over time. Uh, just some general facts, in 2017, 1.7 billion passengers and 31.7 million metric tons of cargo traveled through United States airports. That contributed about 7% to the U.S. gross domestic product. And I think one of the reasons we have this slide in here is because we want, to, we want everybody to understand kind of the magnitude of impact that the infrastructure improvements and the maintenance of these facilities 
represents to not only just the communities on a local level, but to the country as a whole. Um, making sure that these facilities are up to date and that they are able to not only maintain their current status as far as traffic, both passenger and cargo that are passing through, but also stand for growth because all of us in, in every region want to want to make sure that our economy is growing and that our region is growing and healthy. So we want to make sure that that infrastructure is, is in place. American airports face a, a $128 billion infrastructure upgrade over the next few years. In order to meet capacity demands of passengers and cargo shippers, airports will need to provide increasingly safer, efficient, and modern facilities. They face almost $92 billion in debt to pay off past projects, and with increasing shrinking federal commitments to infrastructure, airports will have to find predictable funding into the future. I think the important thing to, rep to represent to the crowd is that those amounts of money are just to maintain the status quo. That does not represent any amount of money that would allow for improvement or growth. That is to maintain the airports at the uh, service levels that they currently exist. So as the, the, fo the working group that was convened approached this project, we asked ourselves what our main pillars of uh, expectation were going to be. This slide puts forth kind of what our three pillars are from the standpoint of what the group had as their core mission goals in analyzing the data here to determine whether or not moving forward with a P3 arrangement for the city was something that would be recommended. The first is that we wanted to enhance and improve the current airport. We wanted to make sure that the operating revenues were increased significantly and that the actual experience of using the airport did not decline. Uh, we feel as if Lambert International Airport uh, is a, is a world-class facility and we want to make sure that any arrangement that would be entered into would not only not just maintain that level of excellence but it would raise that level of excellence. The second thing is we want to generate significant and meaningful proceeds for the city. Now what does that mean? Currently the city receives contributions from the airport in, a pro in an amount of approximately 6.7 million dollars. And regardless of the amount of money that the airport generates, that amount on a yearly basis will be capped based on a formula, regardless of how much profit the airport generates. What we're looking at is we're looking at a situation where a lease payment or some contractual arrangement with the P3 operator would allow for more discretionary revenue to flow from the airport's operation to the city's general fund. And what that would allow is for the city to use additional funds in such a way for public safety, public infrastructure, uh, whatever the city decided that discretionary income needed to be used for. Uh, you'll see later on in the, in the, uh, in the slideshow, and, and a question that comes up on this slide frequently is, well, what does significant and meaningful proceeds mean? We, we mean, we, it's one of those things where we're not exactly sure what that number is, but I think the working group anticipates that number to be a multiple of what the current $6.7 million number represents meaning that we're not looking for an incremental increase from 6.7 to 8 million or 9 million dollars. We're looking for taking that 6.7 million dollars and multiplying it by a factor of three or four or eight or whatever that number happens to be to make it a meaningful experience. And the last thing is, is that we want to expand the regional and economic development relationships for the city and the surrounding region. Uh, there is a lot of vacant land that the airport has in its inventory currently. Uh, the airport also plays a vital role in growth of not only the St. Louis City, but St. Louis County, the Metro East, and other surrounding regional areas. So really what we wanted to make sure is that anything that was uh, impactful from a P3 perspective enhanced the opportunity for all of those different regions for economic growth. <clears throat> the city gave us 11 guiding principles as far as exploring what the potential investment partnership uh, would have. So there's a few things here that we wanted to go through and just make sure everybody was on the same footing as the working group as we went through our analysis of this process. So the first thing is, is there's a prohibition against selling the airport. One of the things we heard early on in our door-to-door uh, -door, uh, inquiries and our phone inquiries were that people heard we were going to sell the airport. That can't be done. The airport cannot be sold. It can be leased. And so this is an arrangement whereby there would be a contractual arrangement potentially with a private individual or a private corporation for operation of all or part of the, of the airport. And that would be, the asset would be retained by the city. It would be leased out for operation to a private, private entity. Uh, one of the things that would be required in any arrangement would be all of the outstanding airport debt would need to be paid off in full. 
And while that all can't happen at once, there are ways to defease outstanding debt um, with reserve funds so that all of that debt then is scheduled to be retired when it is able to be retired. So that would be the second thing that would be required. Uh, whoever would be a potential partner with the city on this project would have to assume any and all existing leases and vendor contracts. There is, and there will be a slide later on in the presentation, that the, the airport currently has a multitude of private contracts and, and public contracts. There's also union collective bargaining agreements that are part of this arrangement. The, any partner, any private partner of the city at that point would need to assume all of those contracts. Uh, the protection of the existing collecting bargaining agreements and future protections is outlined in the contract. The, C, the current CBA uh, with the city union would have to be up, uh, upheld by the incoming partner. That's part of what would be there. The development of an agreed upon plan and approach to offer employment to existing employees not covered by CBAs and future protections is outlined in the contract. A commitment to inclusion, diversity in hiring with a focus on minority and disadvantaged hiring. That was another hot button issue that was uh, voiced to the working group while we were doing our initial data gathering, which is the city employees that are there, what happens to them in the event that the, the airport is transitioned into a private situation. So there have been meetings with those employees and there have been uh, protocols put in place as to how those employees would be treated. And in the event that they were not staying at the airport, they would be offered like employment in other city areas. The pursuit of better flying experiences, additional, additional national and international passenger flights, more freight service to support job retention and expansion for the city and its reason. And, and this is really right the core of what we're trying to do. We're trying to grow the airport. We're trying to improve ridership. We're trying to improve the traveling experience, trying to make this an attractive place through which to travel so that you can grow not only through airlines and cargo, but that the increased traffic then stimulates economic growth in the surrounding region. A development of a plan for growth and development of the airport and adjoining property. One of the things that uh, the RFQ has at its core is a plan. Uh, if you are to lease this land or you're enter, to enter into a partnership with the city, what is your plan for that? How are you going to, to do that? And the, the, any potential partnership would have to have uh, you know, a vision for how the, the land surrounding the airport was going to be used and what type of economic growth uh, the partner would see along with you know a plan not just hey I think this should all be like commercial you know a plan as to how that's going to be developed and how that plan fits into the growth and the other things that we have on this list uh, prohibition against discrimination that goes without saying uh, the city has ordinances that deal with minority participation and discrimination any partner would have to adhere to all of those ordinances and all federal regulation uh, commitment to achieving long-term improvements in the areas of inclusion, diversity, equality, and all the utilization of MBE and WBE contractors, subcontractors, and vendors. Again, another hot-button topic for the city. Uh, there, are, there are pieces of legislation that have required minority participation uh, in contracts that are related to city operation. Those numbers change from time to time. I don't remember which side of them last night. I can't tell you I'm off the top of my head what they are currently. but the. Uh, that would be a minimum target that would be required of the partner. It could, you know, obviously if whatever is, is put in the actual proposal language, it could be more, but whatever the city's minimum requirement is, is more than likely what would be moved forward. Uh, achieving the goal of improving airport operations, eliminating bonded indebtedness of the airport, and evaluating operations for a potential investment partnership. This obviously allows for growth and maintenance of the infrastructure. It also frees the city from the obligation of paying the long-term bonded indebtedness and gives them a more steady uh, stream of income and a more predictable stream of income that could be used on, uh, on other expenditures not related to the airport. And finally, using any net funds in a way that will have a dramatic and positive impact on the city and its citizens. So again, one of the goals here was to take that 6.7 million dollar payment that currently is coming from the airport and increasing it you know by a multiple so that the impact of of unrestricted funds to the city's general fund for other discretionary projects could be could be realized so this gives you a little bit of an idea of how different airports around the world are organized um, 
This slide is something that we inserted into the program recently because there had been questions as to why there are so few public-private partnerships here in the United States and North America, but around the world they seem to be more prevalent. So this just gives you a bit of a rundown of what the different airports around the world by continent are. As you can see, um, the African continent has a percentage, uh, probably the lowest, but up to Europe where you have uh, some of the more developed countries, you have up to 75% uh, private uh, operation. Now this does not represent full private operation. This is any airport that is e either in a complete or a partial P3 arrangement. As you'll see, the North American number is 1%, so we are by far the lowest of any of the continents. This gives you an idea of some of the more major airports around the, uh, I'm sorry, yes? Um, you said people were curious about why. Do you have any historical context as to why Americans are against privatization compared to other countries? Without launching into a major explanation, until the statutory language was changed in the 1990s, that was not allowed to occur under federal law. Okay, is there any more in-depth explanation on the website? Or the yes, there is an explanation for the FAA program to, that, the, that we have submitted our application under, and it'll it, it, it make sure you drink some caffeine when you start reading okay. federal law. But yes, there is a, uh, uh, this was not something that was allowed in the United States because of federal regulation. Okay. There's only one airport at a time that could go through the process uh, based on the size. So if you have a small, medium, or large airport, uh, only one can hold that application slide at a time until recently. So anyway, this I'm not going to go into uh, detail on this particular slide. It just gives you kind of a, a slice of the different airports around the world where they rank as far as, I think that's passenger. Yeah. Is that passion yeah. or is that revenue? It would be good if you did one that had a similar revenue. Like our revenue is 100 million, all those 600 million. No, well, I agree. But I, I think one of the reasons is we wanted to give you kind of a, an idea that some of the larger airports in the world obviously are under public private partnerships, some of them partial, some of them full. So it kind of gives you an idea that the big boys can get it done. So. Uh, this gives you an idea of the status of different applications throughout the United States. Uh, currently, uh, St. Louis is, 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 has been accepted. Did we say what Westchester's has been yes, approved? Is that correct? Uh, the Midway application is an interesting case study. Midway actually went through the process and was close to closing uh, in 2009 when the economy fell apart. And because of that, the funding mechanism for the partner fell apart and that project was, was shelved. Um, they started back through the process again and that application is currently in a withdrawn status. So this gives you an idea of, of some of the other infrastructure improvements that are being considered by other airports around, around the country. Um, in Anchorage, they're looking to increase their terminal, uh, their international terminal, uh, and bring it up to modern standards. Uh, Phoenix is looking for a P3 relationship in order to improve and design their operations uh, and some other major, in, or major infrastructure projects there. They're looking to replace parking spaces, build parking garages and so forth. LaGuardia, New York, and LAX also are searching for partial P3 partners. I have a question. When you said that we can't privatize the airport, but we can lease it, do you have any examples of leasing airports instead of privatization, or are these all these? So we'll get into that a little bit more, but basically, this, what I said in, in, on the second slide was that you can't sell it. Can't this, sell it. Right. This, the, the airport is owned by the city, and it is not an asset that the city can sell. Operation of the airport was also something that in the past you could not contract out to a private operator. So the program that we're entering into is a program <coughs> where the FAA would allow a private operator to come in and operate the asset that's owned by the city, and that would be done through a lease. And the airports that, uh, or that you just saw, by and large, if not in total, all of those are publicly owned airports that have various operation models, depending upon what they chose. But mo mostly, these are all still in the in the public ownership, the question is how they're managed, how they operate. Except for in Europe. Europe you can actually sell, and then there's actual ownership of the airport that, that exchange. So it's not the, the same in terms of how we plan to do things in the U.S., what the FAA allows in the U.S. So our privatization is most likely through a different way, probably leasing. I guess you'll, 
go through it later. Yeah, we'll get into a little bit more of how the relationship would work. I think once you once we get through the slideshow, I think it'll be a little more clear. Okay. But I think it is a an it's an important distinction. What you said is that we aren't giving up the asset for someone else to have. It's an asset that's owned by the city. It's just going to be operated by a private individual. And up until 20 years ago, even that type of relationship was not allowed. And I think it's also important to note that even in this case where it's a lease and the city will still own it, there will be some governance by which the city will have over a private operator. So the city will still be able to have, as a part of their negotiation, you know, how would the airport be run and what they would like to see from that airport under a leased management um, Type of the deal. Yes. Okay, the, the slide before this one you stated, uh, like, okay, we were accepted. What were the, 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 prelim, the preliminary by the others when accepted? It, there are different reasons why. Some of them were withdrawn because the uh, group decided that it was not something that was in the best interest of that particular uh, area. Some of them may have looked at it and thought it was financially unfeasible. There's different reasons why. And, and one of the important things to realize here, because we talk about one of the challenges in making this presentation is you jump forward to the actual final process, right? You jump forward to the point where there's an assumption that the city decides this is a good idea and the city decides to put this out for a proposal. Someone responds to that proposal and then the city ends into, enters into an agreement, okay? That is all speculation at this point. What we are at at this point is just analyzing the process as to whether or not we think this is something that would be recommended. So at any point, that slide could switch from preliminary ap application accepted to application withdrawn. And so basically what has happened is the city has put their application into the, fi to the uh, uh, Federal Aviation Administration and requested the permission to study this issue. That's what we're doing currently. Once that process is complete, and the city negotiates an agreement, if they get that far, then that final agreement then has to be submitted to the FAA for another round of approval, so. Okay, who would require the amount of money that for, the, for the individuals to compete uh, for the uh, application, you know, for the lease? Who, who, who's writing those requirements? That's a good question, and I'll tell you what, if you can be patient for about 10 minutes, I'll answer that question because I got a couple of slides on that. Fair enough? All right. Okay. Yes, sir. No, I won't, because I was going to ask another question about the. Okay, lease. all right. Well, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, you said that the max that we can get to the, the program currently is $6.8 million per year. Correct. Where's the rest of the money go? The rest of it has to go into airport improvements, debt service operations. It has to stay within the airport. Okay, so it goes back into airport Correct. ops. Um, is that because there's bonds owed? Or is that because. Yeah, no, that's federal law. It's that's, that's, that's the way. The federal guidelines, federal regulations, federal statute okay. uh, dictates uh, uh, proceeds of airports uh, disseminated. And that, that number can change based on an algorithmic calculation, but it yeah. isn't going to change right. tremendously. Yeah. And okay. our budget director is sitting here with us looking, <laughs> so if you, you feel free to jump in, Paul, if you have any yeah. comments. Basically, we, we've seen that over the years. It, it goes up, generally with inflation. I mean, so you're going to lose 6.8, 7 or something like that in the next couple of years, and it'll go up incrementally. Okay. But there are some limitations, as they mentioned, because the FAA regulates how much revenue can come to the city versus uh, uh, to the airport. And we're one of a uh, limited number of uh, airports in the country where we do benefit somewhat to that extent from uh, revenue that, goes, uh, that comes from the airport. Itself. Yeah, that, it sounds like that's probably set up so a city doesn't scalp the airport of all the profits and then let the asset deteriorate. You know, well, I, I think that's what's the intent of the agenda. Yeah, 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 that was the intent of the agenda. Why is it okay then to, no, to, not, to not do that? <laughs> because I think the, the I mean, I'm, this is, I'll, you know, I guess I'll put my statutory construction lawyer hat on. I mean, if I was a federal, uh, if I was a federal legislator and I was looking at why the statute was created, it's because there's still a tremendous amount of FAA oversight. So. What you could do in this particular instance is you're all it's essentially what you're doing here at the end of the day is you're looking for somebody that thinks they can build a better mousetrap, right? So if somebody comes forward and they think they can, and the FAA is convinced that that that, that operational and infrastructural requirement is met, that any excess then could flow to the, to the why not just get rid of the law? Why do we have to go to a public-private partnership 
in order to pull that? Why is, you, you, that's the question I'm trying well, to ask. Well, if I could get rid of laws, that wouldn't be the first one I'd start. <laughs> you're, I feel like you're <laughs> and it just happens to be that there's a Republican president, so we're going to get away. Well, I'll tell you what, you and I, you and I can go across the street to the Whiskey We're House and we can debate that afterwards. I but that, yeah. that, I think I, I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> right. I, I think I understand where you're coming from. I think the problem is at the end of the day is that you know we're operating within the framework to which we've been given, and I think that you know you're asking me to look that's, into the head of I federal your, of federal congressmen, and that sometimes can be a dangerous thing. So, yeah. And I trust in any kind of uh, arrangement, um, there would be similar requirements to have a reserve fund, you know, built up for the in infrastructure. You know that would go away. Right. It'd still, be kind of a cap on. Right. On the and, and, and we'll and we'll get into that a little bit later on in the presentation. But yeah, any any conceivable arrangement right. would not only have infrastructure improvements, but then would have plans for funding mechanisms for those improvements. So, um, so just to get back on track, this next slide gives you an idea of what some of our current. Uh, private contracts are at the airport. Not surprisingly, uh, janitorial services, things like parking facilities, uh, fuel, cargo, um, and airport, and that kind of things is, is concessions are things that we currently have in place. And there'll be a slide coming up to kind of give you an idea of what the breakdown is. But obviously, we're looking at a longer term uh, relationship for those different types of, of contracts. I'm sorry, go ahead. So currently, there's 7,000 employees employed at, at the airport. Only 540 of those are city employees. So just to give you kind of a frame of reference as to the number of people working at the airport, how many of them are public employees versus private employees. So well, that's all. Oh, excuse me. Look, that's great. Uh, and really just to tie these last five or six slides together is really just to contextualize it that by and large, all airports are some kind of public-private partnership now already. So this is not changing the operational paradigm is looking is there a better is there a more beneficial way for the city to arrange the way the airport is managed so that it can uh, upgrade the airport as well as provide some direct larger direct benefit but and, it, and it's not the intention I think it would be easy to assume the intention of this slide is to say well most of the employees are private so it's not a big deal that's not what the purpose of the right. slide is the purpose of this slide is just from an informational perspective to just give you an idea of how many employees at the airport currently are private and how many of them are public because one of the hot button issues that's being discussed right now are all of the people at the airport that are employed by the city. That might have been the purpose of the slide, but we just heard <laughs> a different angle on it, which well, I think, us. Right. You know, I mean, come on. Yeah, but I think that I think that that's this is this is the reason why we put the slide in here is that so you guys have an idea of what the number of people are of the, that are employed there are. And it is a status quo issue. I came in late, so P3 is throwing, I don't know P3 what P3 is public-private partnership. Okay, thank you. Our partnership, public-private, you can put them in any order you want. That's what, it's three Ps, public-private partnership. So this gives you an idea of what the current responsibilities are for the airport as far as their infrastructure improvements. The FAA master plan has to be updated every five to eight years. That master plan is something that the airport submits to the FAA with what their current and future needs are as far as infrastructure, not only improvement, but maintenance, making sure that you have your capital assets in such a, of a schedule that they can be maintained to keep your current traffic uh, adequately serviced, and you put your wish list together and things that you would like to see improved so that you can try to grow your operation. Um, one of the reasons this is here is because this is part of what the P3 process would it would take into account. So if there were a public-private partnership that the city decided to enter into, the <coughs> private partner would be part of this process. The, the infrastructure improvements, the infrastructure maintenance would need to be submitted to the FAA and they would be part of the monitoring process for that. So this gives you an idea of what some of the current uh, expenditures are for capital improvements at the airport moving forward in the near future. Um, over the next 15 years, uh, we're looking at taxiway paving, uh, maintenance and improvements, stormwater infrastructure and major vehicle replacements. Uh, these are estimated at a billion dollars. And I think one of the important thing, one of the important things to look at is these are improvements uh, that are meant to keep the current status of, of uh, of service. So if there were any growth that were realized by the airport, that would need to be increased. Yes? Is that the estimation put forward 
forth by the current or upcoming that's, plan, or just the piece? That's the current. Plan? That's what the current. That's what the put current. By the airport? Right. That's an amount of money that, regardless of who's operating the airport, is going to have to be accounted for for capital improvements moving forward. So. Think about it this way: If the city is is decides to move forward with this, and then they enter into a private agreement, this would be something that the private partner would have to take into account. If they don't, this is something that the city is going to have to take into account. Okay. Um, so, this is kind of what the uh, this is the plan that the um, the airline use agreement. These are the different agreements that the airport has with the airlines. It's important to take a look at these and understand that this final arrangement is not only subject to approval by the Board of Aldermen and uh, the uh, FAA, it's also subject to approval by a majority of the airlines. And this agreement is kind of sets the financial terms of use for the airlines for the gates and terminals. Uh, it, they also approve capital expenditures. They take into account uh, what is going to be improved so that it meets their needs. Um, any increases in the CIP require an, an approval by the majority of interests of the airlines. Now that means that, again, this, this agreement will be submitted to them. They have been engaged and kept up to speed as to where the process currently stands. So, yeah. Do you think the airlines out there now, uh, 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 companies that uh, have something like that in place that that you can look at and see how they exist. The, the one major airport in North America that has gone to a total privatization at this point is the airport in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And that was 2018, 17, 13. That's in South America. No, it's in Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Yeah, it's not a state. It's not a state. I said in North America. Yeah. It's a U.S. territory and it operates under the same federal avi aviation yeah. administration yeah. laws. As a, so. yeah. But that, that is the only example in North America of a like-like that we could look at at this point. So one of the other questions that has come up through previous uh, uh, presentations is what's the difference between a, a request for qualification and a request for proposal? Currently, the city has advertised a request for qualification. What a request for qualification is, is it puts out the idea of what the project's going to look like and it asks potential bidders on that project to send in their qualifications. What will happen then is the city will receive those qualifications, they'll look at those qualifications, and if they decide to move to the next step, they'll select people from that list of, of qualified bidders and they will submit to them an application then to present their plan. Um, what this process does is it weeds out people that don't have the capacity to complete the project, the financial wherewithal to complete the project, or have any other myriad of issues that would lead the city to believe that they would not be a responsible participant in the bidding process. So things like screening uh, potential vendors down, uh, it allows the vendors to demonstrate uh, kind of other areas where they've operated successful. Uh, some, of the, some of the bidders that we would anticipate would be international companies, so that some of these companies that are operating airports on other continents would bring forth their expertise, give us examples of the types of things they've done in different areas. They would put forth who their financial backers are, where is their financing coming into place, how are their long-term goal, capital goals going to be met, that sort of thing. Then after that, you would send out an RFP, which is a request for proposal. The RFP would then require the selected folks who have submitted qualifications have been accepted by the city to then submit their more detailed <coughs> plan. So I have two questions. Thing she was, she was yeah, go ahead. I'll go ahead and hold. You hold? I'll hold. <laughs> right. oh, okay. uh, the, who reviews all the financial qualifications for uh, what measures are, are in place to determine who's the most qualified, what is qualified, what is it qualified? Sure. So that process <laughs> is born by the city. So what will happen is the working group has studied the initial data. Why don't you tell them who the working group is? Because we keep saying that. Well, we have a slide. Oh, okay. I've got a slide. Okay. Well, I, I mean, if, it's, if it's done by either the city or the working group, how many contracts has the working group successfully negotiated where an airport's been privatized? Well, let me, let me sure. I'll address that. So, so here's our membership of the working group. Okay. But also, 
part of that is we've, we've hired uh, various consultants to review that who have done this. Okay. And so what, what the process is going to be, basically, as I said, here you've got an RFQ that's out, out there, right? Who, who's done it in the past? What consultant is on here? Yeah, Mayor Brown has been a consultant. Wicks has been also involved. <laughs> and but they've done one. Yeah, I mean, they, they were involved with the, the previous. With, with Midway, Midway as well as Midway. 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 So they were involved. Some on the international. Yeah, but, but in terms of the process going through, right? Yeah. So there's part of these processes you have to go through in order to get to a certain point. So going back to the RFQ stage. So basically you have an RFQ that's out on the street. So the, these companies are going to be submitting their qualifications, financial, operational. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking through the, those, uh, those qualifications, establishing a criteria for what we value as the highest uh, uh, to, to rank those uh, qualifications. And then saying, OK, are they qualified to, if we go and issue an RFP, are they going to be qualified to, be, uh, to provide those services? And that's basically what you I mean, that's typical for any. I mean, this is an unusual uh, oh, process, yeah, yeah. but that would be typical for any RFQ type situation. Yeah. You're you're trying to see who's out there, who's capable of providing the things that you're going to be looking for in any potential RFP. No, I understood. It's just with the one percent that have been successfully done in right. America. I'm wondering, do we have to go to you know Spain or Australia or um, Hong Kong or whatever the airports are that have worked and get their consultants to look over the numbers <laughs> to make sure that we're yeah, I, I, from informed positions. I would think, and, and again, we don't know what responses we're going to get yet, yeah. but I would think in any, anything that you're going to be looking at, you're going to have to be able to see experienced, those that have experienced operating airports, and it's going to be other countries, because there aren't any here, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you're going to have to look at that kind of experience. Okay. Uh, I don't know who was first, but I just want to know, if we were to go to Spain or Hong Kong or whatever, could we, the question would be, I don't think you can answer now, could we import their system to ours? And my second question is, there's been airports who went privatized, but then they pulled it back and started public. And I was wondering, I don't know if this informant will, you, Paul Payne, or any of the working group discuss why were the failures of privatization in North America? Right. Well, I, I think uh, two good questions. I think any 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 response that we get, obviously, going to take into account what experience they have and how much the applicability of their experience in a potential region would translate over in, into this country. And so that's obviously going to be one of the, the things they look at in weighing uh, the, the the viability of any proposal. Um, I, the, and the second question. The question is, uh, what were the failures of privatization that we have to be concerned about? In, in terms of those that did not succeed? Yeah, they, they went privatization, did, but then there went back to Stewart Airport. Stewart. 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 And then what was the failure for Stewart? Big concern, the one that's failing. But yeah. <coughs> that? Stewart. Yeah. Stewart. I mean, what was the. I, I, I would think in any situation. Yeah, I would think in any situation when you got that. Obviously, any. any, any Proposal or any proposer who's got that kind of experience, that's going to be on their resume, so to speak. And so anytime they would submit, hey, here's our experience, and you look at their experience, and if they were successful, okay, good for them. And if they're not successful, that's going to be evaluated to see whether or not uh, they're capable in, in, in doing what we would be looking to find, looking to uh, accomplish with this process. I, I think he has a little bit different question. I think you let me restate it to see if I interpret it correctly. I think you're stating, your question is, what have been the reasons for failures in, in a more general sense of public like, privacy? Like, in terms of, there's been airports that went privatization, but then they revert back to public yeah. airport. Why was that? Right, okay, that's what I thought. You're, you're speaking in Stewart, general Stewart, terms. Stewart's, right the only, Stewart's the only one that's done Stewart's that. Stewart's the only one, but I think what we need to do here, and, and we were doing it last night, is there are questions that, are, that a lot of people have that, you know, this presentation, and our website doesn't address, and we need to be thinking about what questions we need to address in the next round of um, communications that we can't address tonight. And that put that on the list. Mm -hmm. um, There's only one airport that, that unprivatized, and I don't know if it was because of a failure or a change <coughs> in directions 
you know, that's, that's what we already did. So. Do you not consider Denver Airport to be on that list, even though the city withdrew their, you know, the, the one their ter the terminal, yeah, they were doing a terminal partial uh, uh, P3, and there was a lot of uh, things that were going on with that. And, and if you don't mind if I go, in, go into it a little bit. Um, first, I apologize for being late. My name is Luan Strickland. I know they introduced me earlier. I was uh, caught in traffic. But, um, but at Denver, uh, one of the things that we are learning from Denver, because like all these things that you want to learn from them in, in the process, is that uh, taking your time through the process matters. And I'm not saying that nothing wrong with Denver and what they're doing, but a lot of their disagreements are things that could have been worked out before you even got to a partnership deal. And I think the things that we're doing here in St. Louis, with, along with this working group, are taking our time. And, it's, and, you, and some of you are like, man, this is taking forever, or what's going to happen with it? But I do think patience in a project the, the size of, uh, of, of Lambert requires time. And I think that the working group is, is asking all of these questions. They're going to look at any potential bidder that comes in that's part of that Denver uh, consortium are going to have those answers to have to, they're going to have to answer those, the, those, those issues. And why didn't, why, why, did, why was there a breakdown in terms of uh, what the city was expecting and what the, uh, and, and what the, the leaseholder was, was willing to give? And so the, and the short answer is, it's taking our time through it. The Denver process, I'm not saying it was super rushed, but it went by pretty quick. But in this process, we're taking our time. We're over, what, 14 months into this process, and the working group is, is doing a great job of asking those tough questions. If we don't know some, they're asking, and they're just trying to make sure that we find the right fit when the time comes, if we do decide to go forward with the process. I know that a lot of concern um, on the like anti-privatization front coming from citizens has to do with the fact that like if they're aware of the uh, kind of like break, breach of contract or breaking contract in the Denver airport. Um, they're aware that like Mayor Francis Slay is associated with the company that was involved in that and they know that that company might make a bid on Lambert and I haven't had a lot of communication. I mean like I haven't really poured over Fly314's website. Like a lot of working people don't have time to do that but um, communication about that I think is what citizens are concerned about because we hear about all these successes and all of these you know, foreign airports that do so well under different legal systems, and then we, you know, kind of hear in the Post-Dispatch about this one that went wrong that our former mayor is associated with, and we don't really hear Fly 314 discuss that with citizens. So, so, you know, so if I just comment, I think part of our advisor team is they are looking at all facets. They, some of these individuals have worked <coughs> on Midway um, that, have, that almost happened twice and did not. Some of them have worked on San Juan, Puerto Rico, and some have worked in other capacities. And part of what the, those advisor teams are doing is looking at what's worked and what hasn't worked with other U.S., whether it's a partial or full. So I would say that our team is members of our team who are a part of that particular work stream. So this working group is, in, in some parts, why we may not have every single answer in everything right here, right now, is because we have different members on our team that are responsible for different things. And we do have individuals on our team who are responsible for looking at what those other airports are doing, looking at what um, other P3s have either been successful in or, or not been successful in, and they are evaluating that. Those individuals are also the individuals who will be looking at any potential proposer or bidder and determining whether or not they would have the muster for the criteria that are set. And we do look at you know, what's worked in Denver and what hasn't, what's worked with Midway, what's worked with San Juan and some of the others. So that institutional knowledge is definitely, um, we have individuals on our team that have that. Um, I don't know that that's really appropriate for us to list you know, all the things that we want wrong with another airport and then put that on our site to discuss in the public. But we do have members of our team that are very aware of those things. And as potential bidders will come forth, um, they will be evaluating uh, the, the merits, successes or failures of those, those potential proposals. In, in your response about, you know, possible conflicts of interest, our working group, they, they're working through those things. Like I said, and, and it's important to them to understand to make sure that there's not a, any conflicts are appearance of conflicts and that's why I don't know if you know Mike Garvin represents the, the city councilor's office the reason why he's an instrumental part of this working group is to make sure that they look through those things and one thing I can guarantee you is that this working group it, it fine tooth combs everything you know and I'm sure if there is a, a conflict that it will be uh, addressed and the working group will have a proper response to it that will be probably made public I'm almost sure of that 
in, in that kind of track of thinking, sure. um, where do we submit FOIA requests to? Or Sunshine Law requests yeah. for the working group um, materials? I would send it to the yeah, 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 regular, yeah, regular yeah, actually, we can handle it through our regular Sunshine request yeah. uh, portal at, at, at the city. Oh, okay. So, and they typically, I, I haven't and, sent one there. Yeah, well, yeah. No, we, we, we actually, we, almost everything that's public is on the website. Is on the yeah, website. Right. And most of the time, our answers are, well, here's the Sorry. site, and it's been posted something, right. and it's surveyed, or whatever they're asked. There's so, some, the video occasionally, video. you'll come up with something that we, it isn't out there, and we'll, 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 oh. dig up, we'll dig it up. But uh, a lot of it's because of all the handouts and things that we've got out there that are posted already. Can I, can I ask, um, can the people who are actually working for the city, who are city employees, who are these people in this room? Anybody? I saw them. Thank you. And then you guys are I'm part of the city. We're advisors. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm just trying to sort out as you speak what you're representing potentially. Is, is there a slide on number six by any chance? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, the whole document okay. is on the website. Um, yeah. I'm going to get out of order with the question. Um, can we give, can we go back to those? I mean, I, I don't know. I think yeah, again, we need to yeah, some we'll we'll get, we'll get Some of the so questions so. that you have are good, but it's not pertaining to these particular right. slides. And for those that were late, I think we said if you have questions relative to the slide or the discussion at this point, we'll take them. If not, if you'll write them down or hold them, and at the end we'll get to all of your questions yeah. so that we can get them. And I won't. I won't. We jumped ahead, didn't we? We did. I think we. Are we back? No, I think we're not. We're yeah, we're here. So, yeah, I can't so basically, this is just a slide to give you an idea of what the contents of the RFQ that was circulated by the city contained. Uh, there was a letter from the city, an executive summary. There was a description of the St. Louis region, and then a description of the airport, uh, the different leases, and the process that the city anticipated going through, the requirements for the RFQ, and then an appendix, which did include as, as well a conflicts of interest uh, piece. Uh, so what the responses, which is what's probably more important, the responses to the RFQ will require the, these things. It will have to have a cover page. There will need to be an executive summary, which will give an overview of what the strategic rationale of the group submitting their qualifications has. In other words, where do they foresee if they are selected to receive a proposal bid? Where would they see that going? Uh, descriptions, uh, operational and management capabilities, financial capabilities, Contacts and advisors, any disclosures of any conflicts. Uh, again, a list of comparable proje projects, so you would have a references uh, uh, component to that. Acknowledgement of the city's priorities, so there are a list of things that the city uh, has prioritized, and they would need to acknowledge that their uh, proposal would incur what would include those priorities. Uh, give uh, history summary description, case summary jurisdiction. Resolution of any claims litigation within the last five years. So again, if there are issues out there with any contracts or relationships that these folks have had in the recent past, we would have that information. And then any certification, professional, general liability, insurance, so on and so forth, so the city would be protected. Now remember, this is not to bid. This is to receive the ability to bid. Yeah, so. I understand that. But don't you think that you should get some kind of idea of what the ballpark is. Like you mentioned a multiple three, five or something. I'm sitting here thinking it's more like 50 to 100. Well, that um, is going to happen. It's going to happen in the RFP right. stage. Not well, stage. I'm just wondering if, if you get initial feelers out there and they're so low that, oh, gee, we know this isn't going to work. That, but you, again, you, that, that, that you is going to, yourself some time. That will happen in the RFP. And we have it for. You know, we have a process for a reason. You know, okay. I think the first piece is we just want to see who has the capabilities financially and operationally to even move to the next and, stage. And part of the other problem Can is... Can you hold that question because there's a, there's a better answer for yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, I've got some thoughts on that. Yeah. 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 It just seems to me that you ought to have some well, kind of no. idea. Yeah. Yeah. There's a okay. reason for this. Okay, okay. okay. cool. So these are the different the different checks and balances that would be involved in the process, that there would be a creation of the operating standards to make sure that we are not slipping below standards that the city re, uh, has required. Uh, you have the terms of the legally enforceable lease. And quite frankly, this is where the rubber hits the road as far as, of course, the lawyer's gonna say that the legally enforceable lease is where the rubber hits the road, but, but really, the concerns that have been voiced, any agree, any, project, be it the privatization of an airport, or be it the operation and construction of a casino, or a hotel, or any development project that, that any municipality undergoes, is really based on the strength of the agreement. 
And that agreement has to take into account contingencies. So what the working group is doing in this particular instance is making sure that when that in agreement is negotiated, that it takes into account issues that arose in Denver to the extent that they're applicable. Any of the other applications that were withdrawn, we would look at reasons why they were withdrawn and make sure that there's contingencies for that. The city's uh, 11 principles that we had posted, we would make sure that there's language in there for that. So that is, that is a check and balance. There's also airline enforcement, as we had the prior slide, the airlines have contractual interest in what's going on here. They have an approval and they also have an oversight to that. And there's also city enforcement, which would be any uh, remedies that the city would have under those agreements. So this just gives you an overview. As we talked about right now, there's only $6.7 million flowing from the airport. If we were able to grow those proceeds, what could those proceeds be used for? So general fund proceeds are used for such things as community and economic development public safety removal of bright could be added to the reserves or it could be used for capital infrastructure projects in the city that are not related to the airport. So the goal here is to free up more disposable revenue for the city to use in areas that are greatly needed. So this gives you an idea of who our working group is. Um, these are the folks that actually have votes uh, to forward things along. I think it's important for everybody in here to realize that this working group does not approve, disprove, uh, this contract, this prod, this, you know, they don't make the final decision. What they do is make a final decision as to what the working group sends to the city for consideration. The Board of Aldermen is the, is the place where the decision making process is finalized. So these are the folks who have uh, votes as to what we finalize from the working group and what we communicate to the city. Yes, ma'am. So is the working group the same thing as uh, privatization advisors? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So are you going to talk about the privatization advisors? Is there a specific question you have about yeah. that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, uh, there was, uh, and I, sometime last year, something that came out of uh, Mayor Crewson's office about how the privatization advisors are estimated to receive as much as 3% of the total value of a transaction to lease the airport. And if that transaction was worth more than a billion, say, then that advice could net the advisors $30 million. So I'm concerned that anybody who would be about to make that kind of profit um, from giving their advice would certainly be advising for the sale and the privatization. Let's yeah. That's a, a great question, and there's a lot of information, but I think it's, it was covered, I think, in the first round of communications, but we can certainly revisit that at the end. So, now? I, why can't we talk about it now? No. Okay. Most of no, it's not acceptable. Could I ask, what is your goal? Your goal is to inform us for the privatization? No, ma'am. Our goal, our, our goal as consultants to the, to the working group to the working group, and who Correct. appointed the working group again? The working group was appointed by the city. By who? The city. The, the different, different, different factions of the city. Okay. Each one DNA. Right. Because one of my concern is the prof the process, mm -hmm. and this is why I'm very much opposed to it. Mayor Slay, before he left office, he threw that information. What I'm concerned about is how did that process start? who instigated, and who is to profit from it. So this is why I am here. I'm not interested in all this. I'm interested in the process because I smell corruption. And that is what I'm strongly against. Because when someone has money, they buy the politicians. And don't you tell me that Mayor Slay is not a part of that corruption. It's not an open, but that is what my concern is. When you privatize, you don't care about the citizens. That's what they did to the schools with the charters. Well, ma'am, the only thing I can say in response to that is I've been part of this project for okay. 14 months. And Excuse tonight. me. And just, and just I, let me, I'm going to listen respond. to you. I just want you to know where a lot of the city residents are concerned about. It is the transparency Absolutely. and the process. 
and it smells. And I wrote letters, didn't get any response. And the bottom line is, who cares for the people and how are we going to benefit? Case closed. We know that people are going to profit from it. And the one with the S, you know, Mr. Rex, is going to profit from it. But why aren't we talking about it? Why don't we have that information? Let's start from the ground and then tell the people how all this is going to benefit them. Well, I think the first thing I want to say is I've been part of this process for 14 months. I was brought in, uh, my firm was brought in uh, at by, the, who? by the request of the president of the Board of Alderman. The president of the board? Correct. Harry? Okay. And, and what about Darlene Green? This, yeah, she is she on her side? side? If, you, well. if you look at this slide here, there is a representative from the city. Okay, and, and I guess the Ma'am, if you want to answer to the question, yeah. okay, please. So it's a matter of Please, trust. if you would let us respond, okay? Uh, I, I think we want to be respectful and here. And who are you? I am so sorry. My name is Stephanie Lewis. I introduced myself in the beginning. Yes, and I'm, I'm sorry. one of the advisors, and I'm with Grove, Missouri. All of us here on the, on the panel right now are part of the advisor team. We work with members of the city who are a part of the working group, and we have two of those individuals that are here right now. Okay, and who the, authorized for you? I know these, these people authorized you, am I correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, and who authorized those people? In other words, I want to go to- There's a representative from the mayor's office, there's a representative from the board of DNA. And who are they? Well, they're listed here, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, Linda Martinez. In other words, the Linda Martinez is but who started the process? I want to go to the root of it. Who started the process? Let, let, me, let me let me let me jump in for a second here. So you want to say who started the process? The, 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 currently, it's basically a contractual agreement to explore airport privatization. Okay. It was approved. But how that did was, it start? That, it, it, let me, let me, yeah. that was approved by the board of ENA. I'm sorry, uh, who? The Board of Estimate and Portion. Okay. <coughs> the Mayor, the Comptroller, and the President of the Board of All. Three, seven, three so, people. Yes, you're, you're correct. The, 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 the Slay Administration originally submitted the FAA application. Green was against uh, When the, the Mayor Cruson came into office, she renewed that. And she said we would like to pursue that which had been submitted. That was, that was set before the Board of ENA, and the Board of ENA authorized the, uh, the exploration. And that involved a consulting agreement, which involved a lot of the consultants you see here today, but it also established this working group. Mm -hmm. And the working group, as you can see, Linda, who's a, who represents the mayor's office, the Latanya Kenner, who represents the controller's office, uh, Gerard Collins, who represents the president of the board, myself, I'm actually the budget director and sort of his chair, and then you have, then you have other members like the, uh, the airport director, Marlene Davis, who's the chairman, uh, chairwoman of the uh, Transportation and Commerce Committee, and then Mike Garber, who's the city And council. I understand so, that. Okay. I understand that. But who gave the idea for all those three people that supposedly represent us, which the Mayor Cruson and all that, who gave them that idea? All these years and, we've been and, functioning. And, and I appreciate your question. But, 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 okay, but so what, what is my question? Well, here, here's what I'm, I'm going to try to impart to you. That this is a decision by elected officials to pursue this opportunity. And who the, gave them the idea? The Board of ENA authorized this contractual, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, contract to explore the process. So my, my, uh, the, only, the, only, the best that my answer I can give to you is that if you have a disagreement with that particular Decision. I do, and I think that's then you can express that is. to your elected officials. But in the meantime, what we're trying to do here is now that that decision to embark upon the exploration process has been made. Yeah. We are trying to go through that process as called for in the contract. Okay. So this. So is that, that's so, uh, that's the only thing you might not appreciate the answer, but uh, but that's the best I can do for no, you. No, no, no. I respect you, and I respect that. But from the beginning. I was against what Mayor Slay, it was underhanded and it smelled. 
And who is paying all those people? Well, right now, right? Yeah. Well, we're yeah. not paying you yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's I tell you what. Yeah. Let, let's. If you if you would just if you just uh, give us a little minute and let's finish this. There's a big Q and A period after this, and we'll get. <coughs> and, and I promise you, we'll, we won't go anywhere until everyone's questions are answered, but, or, or we try to address you. One questions. one thing, because the the um, lady at the table mentioned that she was from Grove, Missouri, and. Did you also say someone else was from Girls? You see, no, that's so what my the uh, and there are other advisors. Thank you. Because I think it's important that everybody here is aware that that is a Rex Singfield fund. Right. Uh, I, think, that, I think they are. There's no that's transparency, true. and I'm sorry. We've never I'm denied that. Proof, but, 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 I misunderstood but, it. Could, could, uh, I tell you what, can we have everyone's indulgence, please? Yes, yes. Let's let's get through the uh, the, uh, the end of the. Yeah. There's, we're almost there, yeah. see, and then we'll open it up to any questions you like. And we'll try to address them as best we can. But remember, we are not politicians. So if you have issues with politicians, I did, but they don't respond and they don't have open meetings. And I apologize because I'm in the wrong meeting. So that's my fault because I misunderstood. Somebody sent me an email because I'm against totally, totally. I respect you. You're trying to make a living like the rest of us, but there's corruption. And unless you spell it out and the people are saying, see, when somebody has a lot of money, he's a mini coke. Rex Tinkfield is a mini coke, and he is with Prosperity for America. So I'm sorry I'm taking your time. I'm voicing my opinion. I can read all that. I, I, I appreciate and that. And I'm going to do but that. But you're here for the money, and somebody's paying you, and it's not the taxpayers. And that's the sad thing. It's trans, but not trans. I'm so sick of not being transparent. There's no other airport in the city, in the whole country. And something was going on with Puerto Rico. And there's so much corruption there, they don't respect the people. I am so sorry to take your time. I'm sure you're trying to make a living. Thank you so much. Because okay. I saw what happened in the schools. Thank you. And you're trying to, to scam the people for that. They ruined the school system. And who was behind it? Your friend. He's got the money. May I rest? Same and I'm really sorry about that. that is not well, thank you. No, no. I'm not going to do that. I'm just wrong. Well, I'm just going to finish the presentation. Thank you so much for your kindness. Okay. Um, if you're transparent, I'll get it. I don't have to waste my time. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah. So. Uh, we have reached the last slide in the presentation. <laughs> uh, so basically what this slide represents is this slide represents uh, a timeline of what the working group put together when they were considering this project from its inception to its potential end. So the black line represents the preparation analysis and preliminary framework. What that indicated was that that was the working group getting together, putting together a framework in which we were gonna gather data we then gathered that data, how we collected that data, then combed through that data, and then presented that data to the city. We then used that to create the proposed RFQ that the city then uh, took into account and then advertised. So we're actually a little bit further along from where the red line is now because the request for qualifications are outstanding and they're due back on Friday. This Friday? This Friday. And then there'll be a consideration time period once those are received. If the city then would uh, would wish to move forward to an RFP process, that would be the blue line, and then the aqua line would be the uh, post-bidding process where that would be considered by all of the stakeholders that we identified before. You would have the approval of the, uh, of the board, the Board of Aldermen, uh, the airlines, and the, and the FAA. And it's important, one of the questions that, that comes up frequently is, you know, at what point will there be input from the public in that process? You know, we don't have control over that. We have built in time in our timeline for the different uh, stakeholders to, to intake public opinion. I can tell you that the FAA process does have a mandatory public comment period for I believe it's 30 days, is that correct? Uh, so that, at least I can tell you statutorily, there will be a 30 day public comment period for the FAA consideration of that. Um, so this is just, one of the other important things to realize here, and if you read it in the, in the little, in the letters here at the bottom, Communication with the city, including go or no-go decision points. What that means is that we are proceeding with our 
uh, collection of data and moving forward in this process, and we are keeping all of the stakeholders updated on a regular basis. And I, I wish the, 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 the lady would have stayed because one of the things that we are trying to do here is be as transparent as we can be. Um, this process is something that is extremely political. We understand as, as consultants to this project, one of the challenges we have to overcome is that type of, of really, frankly, bias on the outset, that any project of this nature is, is automatically assumed to be something that is you know, a shtick or something where, you know, it's corruption or what have you. Our job here is we have no stake. I know all of us, you know, the Rex's name is brought up at every presentation we go to. I couldn't pick him out of a lineup. We were brought in because the president of the Board of Aldermen asked for our firm to be included. My client is the city of St. Louis, and that really is what I'm concerned with. In, in my experience, what our other consultants are, are concerned with is gathering information presenting it to the Board of Aldermen for their consideration. We, we want to try to answer everybody's questions as best we can as well. Some of those we can answer and some we can't. But we are communicating with the Board at all times or communicating with the City at all times. If at any point the City makes a determination that they do not believe that this is in the City's best interest, they pull the plug and that slide that I showed you where our petition is active, it could be then flipped to withdrawn. And that's, at any point, that timeline that you saw was an assumption that this project moves forward to its conclusion. At any time, it can be canceled by the city. So. We had a question in the back. Yes, ma'am. Um, you keep mentioning the president of the board, Alderman, and his inviting you to be a part of this process, as though that somehow I'm just saying that from the standpoint of that I think that there's a, we've had assumptions in the past that Rex hired all these people and, and, well, and then let, gave well, us to the city and that's not, not, that's not the case. What so. I'm going to say is that last year uh, the St. Louis Business Journal reported that Lewis Reed quote pushed to include campaign donors as advisors to the, Lam the Lambert Airport <coughs> privatization process. So uh, uh, Lewis Reed appointing you and Rex Singfield hiring somebody, um, there's a lot of money to, that's, that's to be gained here. Um, those people who, who were appointed as privatization advisors, uh, you know, if, if it's accurate, what came out of the mayor's office, if they get 3% of the, this enormous package, um, they stand to make a whole lot of money, and um, apparently Lewis Reed's campaign uh, contributors are amongst those people. And, and th those people who contributed to Lewis Reed's uh, uh, campaign are, were not not only not St. Louisans, but they were not Missourians. They're from some law firm, um, the law office of Bernard Charbonnet in New Orleans. I mean, we're, this is about money. You want me to start in yeah, a, and you finish. Yes. Okay. So, um, and this is, I apologize, this might be a little bit simplistic, but the, the we bid for advisors, and we sent out this RF, uh, RFP for advisors, and there were 11 proposals that came in, and only one team had a complete array of advisors, and um, only one team that didn't require the city to come out of pocket up front to analyze this possibility. And so there is a fixed fee. It's kind of like if you were selling your house. The broker, you're gonna get 6% of whatever the number is. And that was the kind of arrangement that we have entered into with the, with the Pro Missouri and, and, and the other advisory team. Fixed number. They, so, you know, the better the city does, the better they do. The worse the city does, the worse they do. And the methodology is not dissimilar, like I said, to a, a broker contract. Now, it, it actually happens to go, well, correct me if I'm wrong, the more the city makes, actually the fee goes down. The percentage goes yeah. down. So, you know, the, there's a, a benefit to the city if, and, and to, you know, a detriment to the advisors. Well, not really. Their, their, their income still goes up. It goes up. It's a smaller percentage, so it's not to their detriment. Okay. There's a lot of this. There's a, well, you know, but the, it's you know, sort of a method. The, the, uh, the methodology, a lot of people think that that they don't, the advisors are going to be swaying us because they, they get paid only if this happens. Well, the answer is actually 
the vast, vast majority of the advisors are being paid on an ongoing basis, and they will, they, you know, they're being paid, and so their advice is going to be their duty is to the, the city, and they must give us advice that's that's in our best interest. Uh, there are three advisors I think that get a little bit more if uh, the transaction occurs, and the one that gets the most at, if a transaction happens, and again, Mike said it right, you know, we could, this is not a foregone conclusion, but the financial advisor on the team basically only gets their expenses if the transaction doesn't occur. And every one of the financial advisor teams that made a proposal had exactly the same terms. The city of St. Louis issues bonds, or goes out to try to issue bonds. If the, if the transaction doesn't occur, nobody gets paid. I've told the story that I, when I was, two years ago, <laughs> I was left private practice, but I, uh, in my prior life, represented uh, underwriters who made, who worked for the city. And, uh, you know, I submitted a, a document to the, to the rating agency on behalf of the city on the night before 9-11. I didn't get paid. You know, that's the way things work in the financial advisory system. And, you know, you're shaking your head because you know, but it, this is, you know, this is set up as a methodology to protect the city on how much of the proceeds would be available to the city as opposed to the, the paying the cost of, of the transaction. Excuse me. So, so there's I don't know if you was other, anything else you want to say about that. She had a, a question about Mayor Slay. So it just hit me. Is he on one of the advisor groups? No. no. Mayor Slay is not on any advisory team, no. So he, yeah, he's out of the picture. Well, well there are people who are part of the team that's going to inevitably win the bid. <laughs> you made an assumption. I did. I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what we feel. He's the public feel. This is a foregone conclusion. And I see he's part of the team. And I don't need a response. I understand that's well, well, let me let me Let me address a couple of things, too. And I've heard this question a lot, and, and, and just from my perspective and what I offer to you. <laughs> when I think it from my, from my perspective when I'm looking at these things. Because I think it's a fair question. You say, hey, you've got advisors, and if they make more money, then therefore they, they steer you toward an answer. But I, but, I, but I always like to look at, okay, what are, our, what are the city's objectives, <coughs> basically? To, and, and, and if we achieve these uh, to, to our satisfaction, then that would, that would instruct us whether or not we think this is a good deal for the city. Right? I mean, that's basically what I'm looking for. And, 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 and that's going to be however you can, uh, and that's going to be a quite drawn out process. Yeah. And, and so, uh, so regardless of what we think might be uh, steered or, or whatever direction, it's going to be, what, are we meeting our own guidelines, our mo own objectives that we set for ourselves? And that's going to be uh, the, basically the, the, okay. the, the indication that set, guides us in whether, what decision we make going forward. Right? Hey, Paul, a quick question. The city issues hundreds and sales and issues hundreds of million dollars in bonds. Probably, would you say you've been budget director over the past, you come up with an aggregate number just out of the sky over the past decade. Okay. How many, how, how, how much aggregate amount do you think we've issued in bonds? Oh, okay. Just in yeah, case. I don't know off the top of my head. But, but, yeah, we, we, but it, it is over a billion dollars. It exceeds a billion dollars when you think. Well, well I mean, yeah. You, yeah. You've got hundreds of millions of, uh, of bonds issued over the over. Oh, the right. And, and in each one of those cases, were there not financial advisors, attorneys, and other professional people who received fees because the city sold those bonds? That's right. And they wouldn't get paid at the deal. I know, but they did. Yeah. Right. And nobody knows, nobody's asking about. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, I'm just no, saying, no, I'm just saying, it ain't, it ain't unusual <laughs> for the city. No, but to issue bonds yeah. and, or and sell on a percentage basis sales. on the transaction. And, and people get fees based on the amount of transaction. Okay. And it happens all the time in the city. That's right. And, and I'm just trying to make sure that everyone understands. And I, I think these are all fair questions, yeah. and I'm just trying to uh, know, I just want to make sure from that, my perspective. I agree. I just want to make sure people understand that the transaction as it relates to people, people were getting a fee for service for the city, that it happens all the time, and there are way more people over the last decade who have received funds from the city for the same sort of financial transaction for the city that nobody knows anything about and nobody in this room is asking about. 
and those and those people work and, and all of our bonds are either issued by the comptroller's office or the treasurer's office. Am I right or wrong? That's good. We haven't been transparent all so, this time. So, so, so why, you still not transparent. You still don't know about the other okay. bonds. Let's, 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 okay. Uh, who was Come first? On, let's be realistic. Um, Go ahead. I said that the, the process for selecting the, the consultants to mm -hmm. go through, was that sealed bid? Was there open? It was still bid, but I mean, it was we evaluated against a set of criteria, right. and yes. and and we also had very yeah, you know, strict criteria up front because as the city of St. Louis, unlike Chicago, we didn't have twenty million dollars to evaluate this opportunity, and we had somebody, and you know, people use this name in vain all the time, but he said, I will pay the cost for the city to explore whether or not to do this. Okay, so you said so there was one firm that met the criteria to be an advisor? Yes. So well, the, the, what, 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 one, one, one team. team. It was, we asked for a team. Right, team. so these are all on that one team? team. Yeah. They were, uh, the vast majority of them. But that's Grove, Missouri, that's a right. law firm, that's a different mm -hmm. associate, and Andrew? Metropolitan from, Strategies and Solutions. So there's four different companies right there. There are actually 13, I think. 13. 13. 13. 13. There's 13. Well, actually, another one we had. Different teams or different firms that are firms on a team. team. Well, this is a very complex project. Oh, I understand. You know, that. I mean, and we didn't. And we didn't. You know, there's no one firm because, as as uh, Stephanie was saying, <laughs> you know, we have people look at oh, airports. So we have people look at infrastructure funds. There are people who look at environmentations and environmental and land use. And you know, this is a, a right. yeah. We want, we want to have a very thoughtful team to make sure we're looking at all the. And cases. so the city isn't out any money. No. no. At all yeah. so far. No. So how can you say, sit there and say ethically that the city is your client? Yeah, you know, you ethically. Did you drive here tonight in the car? I'm sorry. Do you do you have do you own a vehicle? I do have a vehicle. Okay. Do you have insurance on your vehicle? I do. Okay. So if you are in an accident where you rear end someone, you send that and you get sued. Somebody comes because they had to go to the chiropractor. Uh, you send that to your insurance company, right? So my law firm, one of our clients on the Illinois side is State Farm Insurance. So in fact, I got three new suits in today from State Farm. State Farm sends me Mr. Jones's lawsuit and State Farm says, I have a contractual arrangement with Mr. Jones. I am paying you, but your client is Mr. Jones. There are multitude of problems that arise in that type of relationship. But as an attorney, I am ethically bound to represent my client regardless of who's paying my bill. And I have issues all the time with insurance companies where I go round and round because what's best for Mr. Jones in the defense of that case may not be what's best for State Farm or for Prudential or for whoever I happen to be representing. So it is very ethical. It's an ethical thing that we deal with on a daily basis. So I, I, I take it very seriously. As an attorney, I can tell you that, that it frankly, it's insulting to me to say, well, because that guy's paying your bill, you're doing what he tells you to do. That is not the case. And I can't speak for everyone, I can speak for myself. And, and so to answer your question, that's a very, Direct answer. That's how. That's how I deal with it. I have to do it every day. Yeah, yeah. I like to think about that because you know, I'm a professional as well, and and then I read other things that you know if you don't have that interest a lot, or you, you start to as an attorney, right? If you start to work with for somebody without getting any kind of payment, but um, they're getting, that's why they're getting paid. We're getting paid. They are getting. Yeah, we're getting paid. paid. Not by the client. Right. Well, there be they take take it back. What our what our consulting group was was hired to do is our consulting group was hired to collect data and put together an organized representation of that data to the city for their consideration. One of the things my law firm did was we did all of the analyses for all of the right. real estate parcels that were owned by, and I had to report that data. Right. So I can't. I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm just suggesting that a, a better arrangement would have been for the donor to give money to the city, for the city to hire you and pay you out of the city pocket. That, in my mind, that's a better arrangement and fair. And also then the city has uh, oversight over expenses that are submitted. You know, and everything. Remember, remember about, our fees are capped. I'm you know, sorry? The city's fees are capped. Basically, actually what we've got is better than that because if it if it takes thirty months to do this and and the you know we said it was like two point eight percent is that the highest percentage I think if it's two point eight percent no that's not what I read though I no. read about the expenses well that's because you were thinking about what Tony Messenger wrote and he said it's this amount of month amount per month regardless of how much it is per month if we get to the end and if we do the deal 
it's a certain percentage regardless of how much. So if it takes 30 months and he, and, and he spends X and we only give him 80% of X, he eats the rest. So Linda, what is that amount? Um, I, it depends on how much the transaction is. What is the percentage? I think it's 2.8 is the highest. I think it goes down to 2.5. It, 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 it goes down. Uh, what is the max? The max is 2.8% up to, I can't remember, is it up to a I, I, I'd have to look at it again. It, it is in the contract, which is posted online, but yeah, I would have to look at it. And that's something that the public is going to want and should know before anything else. And with you coming here saying, oh, I'm not sure, well, we that's, want to that's kind of something to keep in your pocket. No, well, well here, here no, 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 it, as a percentage, it, it, it's determined. As a percentage, it will vary based on what the actual number of the, 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 <coughs> number of the transaction is. So since you don't know that, you're not at that step, you're not going to know that. But you will know that by the time you, if you get to that point, when you get a, a, a number, you will have that number uh, in, in part of the process in, in terms of approving. And, and what I think I heard from you is the max is 2.8%. I, I, you know what, I mean, I'm not going to get off the top of my head because I, I don't have that. But, it, but it is in the contract, it, it's, it's, it's posted on. It is a sliding scale. Let, let, let's, let's respect, uh, I, I know you had your head up a long time. Um, my question was about the working group. I know that the chairperson of uh, Transportation and Commerce is on there. Mm -hmm. What actual like power influence does the working group have? Because just this week, uh, Marlene Davis voted against not one but two different bills introducing the idea of a public vote into this process. Okay, and, I'll, I mean, and that's a good question. But uh, from our standpoint, it's the working group. Our charge is not to make a decision based, and I know this has been a big discussion about should there be a vote or not to be a vote. And from, when, from my perspective, in terms of what our charge is as a working group, that's more of a decision for the elected officials to make, and we'll abide, obviously abide by whatever that decision is, but that's not something that we, want, uh, as a working group, Intending to get involved with, so we that's that is a, a recommendation that the. Our recommendation is more based on what proposals we receive and what the numbers are and all that kind of thing. When you have something, a decision such as that, which is more of a political decision, but elected officials, we, I, we didn't see that as our charge to, it to is, enter it that. I mean, well, my question, one question you have not answered was, what is the difference between an outright sale and a lease? Okay, we finish this question. Yeah, I, 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 I know, but we're in the middle of a question, so just let's be respectful of everyone. We'll, we'll answer everyone's questions, but let's do it respectfully. So let's finish your question, and we'll go to the next. My, my question more specifically, I guess, was to do with what influence and decisions does a working group make? Because there is an elected official sitting on there right. that is also exerting her influence to deter a public vote. Like well, she, well, she is. A, she's a member of the working group. She doesn't. Uh, she's not. She's one of the non-voting members of okay. the working group. There are. If you look at the, the membership, there are seven members. Four are voting members, and then three are there for the, basically their expertise in whatever particular area they have. Obviously, you want the, the, the chairwoman of the transportation commerce committee because this obviously is a, an issue that affects that that area of government. So she participates in that way. We have the director of the airport as well, and then the city council who advises us on, on some of the legal matters. And, and so that's how it was comprised. But, uh, so she doesn't really exert any Well, she, she, she has. Can you, she, you, know, she, you, know, she, you let her speak? Yeah. Well, yeah I'm well, she, curious, she, she's free. She, play? she has access and, and is free to participate in all the meetings we have, and, and, and as a member of the working group, gets shared information as well. But again, there's a, a, a slight difference between that and then voting on something that the elected officials decide, which is something like a, a, a vote on it. Okay. But if your specific question is, is Marlene Davis working in the working group against uh, an opportunity for people to vote, the working group is not considering that issue. So right. it's not, she's not I mean, saying I, it. Even if she's not, I would still consider it a conflict of interest. I was just wondering what actual direct influence that she has because she's, you know, she said in, in the TNC meeting last week that this presents an opportunity for us to fix blighted communities in our roads, and, and that's obviously not something that everybody in the city believes. And, and that's and that may be true, but also she's elected official, and, right. and, and, and yeah. So vote on. And it should be noted that there are though, exactly. a number of people who do believe that. So I, I know that in the in this context, we hear a lot of people who are against. 
but there are a number of people who want to see at least what the potential outcome could potentially be that could be a benefit for others in certain parts of the community. So we do need to make sure of that. And I think what she has been trying to do is to bring that um, sentiment to the committee so that she's representing everybody. She's representing those that are against it, but she's also representing those that would like to see it move forward in the process. And I, and I also think it's fair to say, and, and Paul is correct, that we don't have any say in in how the city makes a determination as to what they're going to do. But as a working group and as consultants, we haven't been very encouraged, encouraging to them to seek public input in whatever way they deem necessary. So, you know, these outreach meetings that we've been doing all summer have been a result of us recommending, making, attempting to be as transparent as possible and get information out there. So, so while we don't have a say in that, and, and, and nor would we presume to have a say in that, we certainly are encouraging to seek as much input as they can possibly get. Yeah, I think we have three questions, so we're going to go. Yes, I just want you to know what is the difference between an outright sale and a lease privatization. I asked you the question right. before. So, so if you want the legal, the legal terminology would be you are retaining the underlying fee to the property. So you are retaining the ultimate ownership of that asset. So if if you if I have a house and I sell that house to you, I no longer have an ownership interest in that house. If I have a house and I lease that house to you, I retain the underlying ownership of that house. You merely have a right to be on that property based upon the contractual arrangement that you and I come to, all right? And that could be, let me finish, because that could be one of the things you're gonna ask is, well, who gets to keep the improvements? If they spend money to improve it, how does that work? The lease document, in the event that we get that far, that lease document will spell out the terms as to how improvements, capital improvements to the airport would be retained by the city in the event that the public-private partnership is broken. So basically what happens is at the end of the lease, if there isn't a renewal of that lease, the city retains the property at the end of that contractual arrangement. So that's different from if I sell it to you, I lose my ownership interest altogether. So in this particular instance, the city will still maintain ownership of the underlying asset. The role that that private partner has in its operation has yet to be defined. We don't know what that agreement's going to look like. So I can't tell you how much operational control they're going to, to undertake because the city, frankly, hasn't made a determination as to how that's going to look. So, but it will look in some form or of, of, of a simple arrangement that I just represented to you. If I have a house and you lease my house, we will put a contract together as to what you can do in my house, when you can do it, and when that relationship ends, and how much it's going to cost. And that's the basic arrangement that we would have here. Sir, does that address your question? I guess that's as far as question as you can answer at this time, because you don't really know Correct. the practical uh, right. application yes, that's going exactly. to happen. Exactly. And that is why I think I mean, I, I think it should be a vote of the people, but that's as far as you can answer at this time. Okay. Well, and, and let me let me just take it a step further because I don't want you to walk away unsatisfied with the answer. So, and Mike I'll, probably I'll Mike, well, Mike will jump in here. So, one of the things that Mike and I have done for cities around the region is development agreements. I've done casino agreements, hotel agreements. He's done hotel agreements. Any of those processes follow this exact same process. Okay, we're not we're not changing processes that are normally used in a situation like this. So let's say when I was involved in the development of the Casino Queen and we were doing certain improvements there, we would put out an RFP and people would respond to that RFP. We would then take that information from that RFP and then you enter into a whole separate negotiation phase at that point, right? You select the person to whom you want to enter the partnership with and then you negotiate that agreement after the fact. So. Well, we're, we're in the process now of even deciding who we're going to invite to the dance. Then we have to decide who we're going to dance with. Then we got to ask them if they want to dance. And then we got to decide on what song we are. We're still at the point of who we're going to, who we're going to invite. So at the end of the day, the answers to your questions is if the process proceeds to the end, after the RFP is complete and someone submits an application that the city believes is in its, 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 its best interest and all the other stakeholders believe it's in its best interest, at that point, you'll enter into a negotiation for that lease and those types of terms will be fleshed uh, out. Yeah, and that's as far as you can yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because it, it, to kind of put a point on this, <laughs> and if the, if the lady that left was still here, what I would say is, 
if you are philosophically or a priori opposed to this project, there's nothing you're going to hear in this meeting that will resolve that issue. Okay? I mean, this, this, this is not, a, as a matter of fact, we're not even in the process of advocating for it in, in that concept. So that's a decision that somebody else made, and the appropriate people made it. You may disagree with it, but it was the mayor and the board of residents. That's what they got elected to do. If you want to understand how the process is evolving and where it is at this point, that's what these meetings are for. It still doesn't answer anybody who has the philosophical or policy objection at the beginning because that's not what we can deal with. That, that decision was made by somebody else and it's already been made. And you put a, a you raised an excellent issue that you won't ultimately know whether you think it's a good idea or not till we get all the way to the end and you can actually see the negotiated document that Michael has, talk, has talked about. At that point, you can make a final evaluation about do you think this is a good proposal. But all that you have here is as we go through the, the, the process on the interim, we can give you uh, 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 intermittent uh, progress reports about the status of the project, not about whether it's a great idea or not, but just the status. That, that when we get to the end, it's almost like it being a parent and somebody asks you, uh, uh, how do you think your kids gonna turn out? I say, well, I have to wait till they get grown. I can't do anything about it. Then I'll know if, if, if I did a decent enough job. So at this point, you will, everybody will have to reserve judgment till they see the, 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 the final project. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that question and then we can talk about process and where we are in it, but we can't resolve those. Uh, I have a question in the back, policies. then here, and then there, and then there. So bear with us. And okay, uh, I had two questions, and now two comments. Uh, first, this is such a good idea. Why didn't the city do it in the beginning and make the money themselves? Second question, how is this different from the arrangement with the um, Keel Aud well, Auditorium Enterprise Center this week and that? My two comments, comment number one, wasn't the Board of uh, BOA, uh, the uh, Board of Estimates, Estimate. wasn't that a two to one vote? Right. Okay, and secondly, I think when people are coming out to find out more information on something that has left the, that has been pushed through, I don't think they should be accused of being biased. I'm through. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take some. In terms of uh, the first one where you're uh, Question: If this is such a good idea, why why haven't we done it before? I think is what the question was. Why did Why did the city doing it themselves? Well, the answer to the question is I don't know necessarily whether this is a good idea. That's the whole thing. I, if you ask me, I have no idea whether it's going to end up being a good idea or not. That's what we're exploring. So until we get some answers to that process, I, uh, we're going to have to stay tuned because I because I couldn't give you an answer today whether or not it will work out that way we haven't gotten any proposals or the teams yet even to look at so that one I, I don't know yet um, in, in terms of the uh, the other ones I, I think we were talking about a vote of two to one and all that kind of well it, yeah there has uh, as you know if you follow how we make decisions in city government you have elected officials and some people uh, some of them agree some of them disagree but whatever the collective decision process is that requires the passage of a particular whether it's a piece of legislation or a proposal whatever the prevailing vote is that's what is decided by the elected officials and then we have to carry that out and that's what you're seeing as the process here today um, 
But going back, price, to, back to your first question, um, you know, when I sold my house, I, I hired a professional real estate agent. You know, people who've done this before, who have expertise, and you pay them, a, you know, a fair wage. And so, uh, the city's going to get, you know, ninety seven plus percent of the, the proceeds if we go forward with the transaction. And people who have who are experts, who gave their expertise to this, will get paid as you know, will be paid also. But it's, uh, you know, it's this is not an RFP that the city could handle by itself. You know, I think if you look at the, the kinds of companies that are running professional, you know, professionally running the airports throughout the world, we need the strongest minds and the, the people with great backgrounds to be on the city side. And, and we have it. We have people who worked on San Juan, we have people who worked on Midway, we have worked on people who worked on airport transactions throughout the entire world, on our team, on our side. How is it different than the Enterprise Center, which is a uh, city-owned property, which has been milking the, the city, and um, how is it different? Well, the, um, to me, it's a different kind of a P3. It's a, it's a, the, the airport is, creates a revenue stream for the city of St. Louis, and that's what, you know, when you go back to the, the points, the three points that we, you know, that we go to all the time to talk about what the objectives of the city are that were stated in the original application that we submitted to the FAA. When we, as a city, did the, the enterprise center transaction, what we were asking is, if we give you a piece of land, will somebody build, will build somebody do an, an arena? So it's, it, it's No, a, the, the, the arena was already city owned. The, the land is city owned, nothing else about that is, is no, owned by. Enterprise center, Keel Auditorium. I know, I, I, I know. They, they, the improvements are not owned right. by the city. And, and I, think, I think to take it just a step farther, there are apples and oranges at this point. The, the airport, we have not negotiated that lease yet. And when that lease is negotiated, it will be completely and wholly a different agreement from the agreement that, that operates at Savas Enterprise, Scott Trade, whatever we're calling it today. So this, this, this lease agreement is gonna be a lease agreement that is unique, frankly, to probably anything in the country at this point because of the FAA, role in this because the airlines role in this that document is in the terms of that document and the different federal laws that have to be accounted for and the different uh, other contractual arrangements that have to be accounted for it's going to be completely different from anything that has to do with any arena downtown so the only thing that will be the same is you have an asset of the city and an asset of the city and you have a, a private partner that you're dealing with after that the comparison between the two is not even in the same ballpark um, we have like a, a couple questions here. How yeah. is Darlene Green? Excuse me. Excuse has, me. Has we have Darlene a couple Green, questions here. Has our controller, who was voted on by the people, has she changed her position on wanting a public vote on this? Has she changed her position? I, I, I don't know what her position is. That, like I said, this is not. We we aren't involved in that side of the transaction. But Latanya Kenner comes to all the meetings and. The, the control appointed two financial advisors mm -hmm. that, that work with this team to help us understand it. So she is very much participating in making sure that what we're we, saying is you I don't, don't know where she can stands you, at this please, point. Can you please let me speak? I mean, you're saying a lot, but I just asked a simple question. <coughs> and your answer was to that question has been answered. You're not sure where she stands, but she has participants. I, I'm not, I don't want to speak for her. It's not, it's not my job. So you don't know where she stands. Well, I, I can read the newspapers, but I, I don't talk to her about that because that's a, a political issue, and I'm I'm tasked with you know looking at. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate you. Okay. All right, sir. So, yes. Um, I'm just trying to get a handle on, and I understand this is jumping ahead, sure, right? but you're, you're selling it as part of the sales pitch. Yeah, it, oh, From where are you going to create? Where are you going to pull thirty million dollars into the airport profit? extra money that doesn't currently come into the airport. Well, do you want my, my boldly honest answer well, to that is? Well, he said five times current. Well, he said eight my, times my honest answer to that is million. maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. I think the, it's not, frankly, it's so, not so my. So it's not the six million. It's, That's it's, why we're doing this. Right, exactly. And, so, and, so how 
Are you going to pull more money in this airport? The airlines aren't going to give more money, not so the city can make more profit. Wait, 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 wait. Let me, I, I, I just want to understand where you yeah. think, because you obviously think you're going to make more money, so how? Well, well okay. I, I, I just wanted to go ahead. I mean, here, 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 here's the thing. Here's You're not going to know until you actually get responses back. So what, what we're doing is, again, right now you've got an RFQ out there that's looking for quality. Things. So that's now, so no, let me, let me, unsatisfying because you're using it as a selling point. No, no, yeah. let, let, me, let me, may I finish? Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. so you've got an RFQ that's out there and you're asking for 10 million dollars. What would it follow? Let's say that's successful and you've got a yeah, uh, successful one. Then what it follows would be a request for proposals. And the request for proposals would be very detailed. It's gonna have, hey, here's all our financials and here's all that. What ideas, could you have, uh, if you're uh, proposing? Okay. If this you're, is not answering my question. Well, well, I, I, I don't need to hear the sales pitch. Okay, but I, that's. I got the rah rah. I understand all that. I, I, well, well, <laughs> let, let, let me. I respect your question. Sorry, I so know. Try to that. respect I, my answer, I please. Apologize. Okay. So, so you're going to be asking proposers to say, based on all this information you're going to be getting, what do you have an idea that would meet all these criteria, meet our the city's objectives? That can that can uh, produce those kind of results. Right. Now, if the answer is we don't see a way of doing all that, then you don't have it. Then obviously, the, the thing is going to be, hey, we don't we don't like the results, and then it ends. Right. But if you get on the <coughs> other hand, you get some ideas out there, right. and they look at the potential op things, and they look at the land development, and they come up with a proposal that looks viable. Then maybe you've got some, right. um, but you're not going to know that until you get the thing well, that scares me. Well, I, just to kind of help you along that question. The city doesn't know the answer to that no, question. But you're so, using this part of your sales no, pitch. No, so I mean, so, you so, so what'll happen... You, you're not going to give an idea, that's fine. No, I mean, you don't need so, more of the, it's coming. I'm sorry for interrupting you again. It, it's a hypothesis at this point. But <clears throat> you will have some definitive idea based on the response to the RFC. Because if people who do this for money don't think they can generate money. They won't respond. Right. And at that That's point, right. the city will have. We have a long, I'm sorry. Too yeah. soon. Well, now I said, and the city will have its answer. If somebody says that they can do it, and at a superficial level, the, the documents that they submit looks like they can, then you'll enter into the next more complex phase of it, and that is <coughs> testing their assumptions as you negotiate whatever the terms of the deal are. So what Mike and Paul have, have been trying to emphasize is that the answers to these questions you get inside of the process, and at any point in time when you get enough wrong answers, it's over with. If you get enough right answers, all it means is you get a chance to go to the next step until right. you finally get to an end one way or the other. Right. So, so guys, we have, uh, uh, we're getting close to our time. I think the gentleman has come. We have three questions that uh, people have raised their hands. We're going to go to this young lady here, this gentleman, and then the lady in the back. And those will be our three uh, because I think we're getting close to our time. Um, I know you say that RFQs are due. Uh, so you guys priority. said we were going to be able to answer all the questions. I'm very sorry to interrupt. You said we were going to be able to answer all the questions, and then you just change your mind. Not great. Okay. So will that information be made about getting kicked out? So. <laughs> the RFQs that's due Friday. When will that be made uh, public to for you know so we know who actually requests sure. it? Yeah, we're, we're going to be discussing that. At, we have a working group meeting tomorrow. We're going to be discussing that. I think we're going to try to get as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, it's the end of the business day on Friday, okay. so as soon as we, as soon as everyone, they can correctly assess what we've received and the because we want to make sure the information is correct that we've got. As soon as we've got it available, we'll, we'll be issuing something. Okay, James. Okay, so uh, Seinfeld put the money to hire the study. He gets paid if the privatization goes through, doesn't get paid if it doesn't go through. Obviously, there's a lot of apprehension because of what happened with the head of the county council. They fully back. The guy is now spending hopefully 46 months in a North Dakota prison. Um, so also, my understanding is, you know, he's involved with the several mutual funds, one which is Oak Tree. Oak Tree is also potentially bidding 
on you know leasing the airport. How would that be handled? Is that to me? I mean, it takes a lot of puts to, to do that after what I just said. And that he's funny. This. How would you handle that? Well, we have uh, a number of different uh, checks and balances when it comes to conflicts of interest, and uh, we can talk about those. Um, every one of the advisors has signed a contract that says their only client is the city of St. Louis, and it says that they can't be part of any team that bids on the, right. the transaction. Um, what, and it includes the Royal Missouri transaction group. They have signed it as well. Now, I think that there's a lot He's of. He's third parties, so you know Well, that. but I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about what Mr. S uh, Sinkville manages funds. And I actually, I thought he was retired. No, he's he retired. Is, he's retired. No, yeah. this is so, partners. you know, so he's not, he's not the one that says, you know, I mean, they can pull in and out of. No, he's got investors. So he's still connected. But he doesn't, he doesn't manage those. It's, no, I mean, I have investments in no, S&P 500, and, no, no, and no, no, if somebody no. happens to make buy more cereal. Money out of it. Yeah, but it's definitely in conflict. He's not directing those investments. But, no, no. And, but we have, we have very so strict. Yeah. We have very strict policies, and they can, there cannot okay. be an overlap, and there can't be. Right, and one of the, the pieces that we put at the, the last piece of the, uh, the RFQ is everybody has to that's submitting uh, qualifications also has to say that they've not worked with any of our team members, and that, that, that there's a, a lack of conflicts of interest. Okay. They have to certify that. All right. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, before I ask my question, I just wanted to say that um, Darlene Greens uh, was quoted in uh, last week's Riverfront Times as, and this is a quote, the process exploring privatization of St. Louis Lambert International Airport has been designed by and for special interests. Unsurprisingly, this RFQ is shaped by assumptions to appease those interests and I have no confidence that this process will yield an outcome supportive of public interest. Requiring a binding public vote on any selected proposal will go a long way in alleviating the public's concerns about special interests. I, my question is, what, and I, I think we all, the people that I have been talking to, want to know what we can do, what, as part of the current administration, you would tell us needs to be done to ensure that there is a public vote on perhaps an amazing and wonderful RFP. Why? You need to reach out to your elected officials. We are not elected officials here, so you know we have no ability to affect the, the legislation. But you, you are part you of the administration. You can well, tell us why. You know, well, you're you're hired, hired, so but you don't is know. Opposed. If I had a job as a professional, and I did not know that simple answer to this question. As a person who works in an office, it is important that you know what those powers that be say. We have an election that will be coming up, and this could change in a millisecond. And that is what will happen. Therefore, it is important that you all, as people who are hired by us, know those answers when you come to speak with them. Let, let me, let, let me no, well, let me address that one in very particular, because I addressed it before, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. The, the issue of the public vote, because it's been brought up before, it was brought up in the Transportation Committee meeting, uh, I think, months ago, and I answered it the same way. That is basically a decision by the elected officials. And, and in that, and it, since I'm not in that role, and that's not our charge, it's the working group. That's something to decide. That's something elected officials decide. So, so if you feel no, let me, let me, if you if you feel strongly about that, then yeah, then you then you contact your elected officials, who, whatever they use, your alderman, the mayor, the president of the board, whoever, and and that's how the process was working. But in terms of our, our work as a working group, that's not something that it would be appropriate for us to as being part of uh, Mayor Cruson's administration, why, asking why she, because I've read no explanation, um, why she is opposed to a public vote. I think that's not, uh, if you read the, the newspaper, but only that's her position. So uh, I, 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 not a caller, I are politicians, and we're trying very hard to be objective and look at the facts. And if the, the Board of Aldermen and the Board of BNA say that the, the they don't want this to happen, like they say they want a public vote. 
That is not for me to say. It's, it's, well, you know, it's not for you to say, but I thought perhaps you could give us an insight into why the mayor has been supported. I think if you actually go back and look at the newspaper article, she's stated the position. That's not quite what you're saying. So. Can I, can I say this? Thank you all for coming. Uh, I know that there are a lot of questions and we would love to stay here all night, but as you can see, the library is pushing us out, so we do need to be respectful uh, that these uh, fine people would like to go home. There is another meeting on Saturday at Walden Park. You're more than welcome. I believe that meeting starts at 2 o'clock. You're more than welcome to come to that meeting and get any uh, other questions answered or you're more than welcome to submit your questions. There is a place on the Fly 314 website. You can submit questions there and we will uh, try to address any of your questions that you have. Thank you all for coming.